A'udzu billahi minasy syaithanir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Chapter 10. Reformists, Modernists. Traditional Muslims versus the Modernists. Being a traditionalist Muslim is a reactionary term. The term had to be coined in order to make the necessary distinction against modernist and reformist Muslim. The defining feature of a traditionalist is respect for the intellect of past Muslims and a skepticism in the validity of modern exceptionalism. The modernist in contrast is skeptical of the intellect of past Muslims and a firm believer in modern exceptionalism. In other words, modernists believe we live in a unique time and that that necessitates practicing Islam in a way that has never been practiced before. Modernists also tend to believe that in modern times we have unique knowledge that past Muslims were not privy to and that knowledge licenses us to practice Islam in a way that it has never been practiced before. The traditionalist, on the other hand, finds this reasoning not only unconvincing but even irrational. What is so unique about modern times that merits the adoption of unprecedented beliefs and practices? Over the past 1400 years, we are still the same species with the same needs and basic mental makeup, the same tendencies, the same weaknesses. Which is not to say that the Sharia does not accommodate certain kinds of change and variations across time and place. But our times are not exceptional and unique enough to even begin to justify some of the things modernists are calling for. Traditionalists also respect the intellect and spiritual insight of the collective body of Muslim scholarship over the past 1400 years. If there are beliefs and practices that the vast majority of, if not all, scholars upheld, that in itself is evidence of the validity and soundness of those beliefs, practices. The community does not agree on error. What makes us so special? What unique intellectual capacity do we have to go against the tide of historical unanimity? Communist Islam. What we can learn from that travesty. In the 20th century, communism was very popular with a group of academic Muslims. For these Muslims, communism represented the peak of justice. It represented the peak of worldly civilization as the USSR at that time was ascendant. So these Muslim academics wrote fervently about how Muslims needed to adopt communism and how true Islam was communist at its heart. They interpreted the Quran and Hadith in that light, pointing to verses about zakat and sadaqa as divine directives against private property. Of course, there were many parts of Islamic law that take certain property relations for granted, but since these conflicted with communism, the Muslim communists attacked the fiqh, called it backwards, unjust, and nothing but a capitalistic distortion of God's true religion. According to them, the classical ulama were obviously just serving their own interests as property owners, so they created fiqh to advance their bourgeoisie agenda and oppress the working class. Other Muslims of the day pushed back against this, poked holes in their arguments, and defended the ulama from their smears. Having then rebuffed intellectually and communally, these Muslims became more extreme little by little until they decided to leave Islam entirely. Didn't Marx say that religion was the opiate of the people? Didn't these traditional Muslims reject the clear justice of communism and the insights of historical materialism? It must be Islam itself that is the problem. So they become apostates and denounced Islam along with the Muslim sheep who followed it blindly. Despite it all, they had high hopes that in the near future, the light of communism would overcome the darkness of the Islamic tradition and the entire Muslim world would follow them into enlightenment. Soon thereafter, communism went out of vogue. The USSR fell. By the end of the 20th century, no one remembered anything these people had written or advocated for. Their movement was flushed down the toilet of history. Today, social justice, liberal Muslims openly, militantly calling people to fahisha and disobedience, brazenly slandering the ulama and sowing the seeds of confusion in Muslims' hearts are on the exact same path. May Allah expedite their fate. Is Islam the reason the Muslim world is backwards? Latin America begs to differ. The perennial question, why does the Muslim world lag behind? The perennial answer, because of Islam. We accept this kind of analysis from the likes of Orientalists, Neoconservatives, and Barack Obama. Some Muslims also share such sentiments. From the beginning of the colonial period, self-hating Muslims have agreed with their colonial masters that Islam is a problem and the only way forward is to shed Islam. Of course, the self-hating Muslims don't come out and say Islam is the problem, literally. They will instead say things like Islam needs to reform or we need to revisit classical fiqh and apply new ijtihad as needed or classical scholarship had misogynistic elements. 
This is the not so subtle approach of Muslim modernists, who oftentimes will be classically trained themselves and will wear all the trappings of traditional scholars. Not all modernists wear suits and ties. Some wear more traditional garb. Three art reformers, Jamal al Din al Afghani, Muhammad Abdu, Said Ahmad Khan. Yes. By wielding religious authority and using religious language, these modernists are better able to influence the average Muslim, who generally has a deep respect for ulama and sacred knowledge. The colonial powers, of course, recognized this and took advantage by deputizing some of these scholars to advocate for European interests. This dynamic is still used in full force to this day. Now let's think more deeply about this question of lagging behind. Who stands to benefit when Muslims view their bad economic position in the world as a function of their own religious tradition? Hmm. Well, if that question is too difficult, let's look at other regions of the world that are lagging behind. In the news recently is Venezuela. Why do countries like Venezuela lag behind? According to Western liberal commentators like the New York Times and recently Donald Trump, the answer is simple. Quote, that Mr. Maduro, president of Venezuela, must go has been obvious for some time. Since he succeeded the leftist strongman Hugo Chavez in 2013, his mismanagement, cronyism, and corruption exacerbated by the drop in the price of oil, Venezuela's dominant source of revenue, have brought the country to ruin. Hyperinflation has rendered wages virtually worthless. People are dying of starvation and lack of medical care, and millions have fled to neighboring countries." End quote. See? Western powers only have the best interest of Venezuela's people at heart. These poor Venezuelans are starving to death. They have no medicine. They are experiencing hyperinflation. We have to do something. We have to support regime change. Perhaps we need to invade. That is the only humanitarian option at this point. Of course, no mention of the fact that the starvation, the lack of medicine, the hyperinflation, etc. are the direct result of years of sanctions on Venezuela. Gee, isn't it amazing how when you put severe economic sanctions on a country, that country will suffer economically? Then conveniently, you can blame whatever political faction you want to get rid of for the economic hardship in order to justify supporting a military coup or even a ground invasion. This is the circular reasoning the New York Times and other Western media outlets trot out without a shred of self-awareness. Poor Venezuela is not the only victim of this tactic. Many other Latin American countries have been brought to their knees by way of American humanitarianism. America, the savior of the world, has to save these backward countries from their own incompetence. It's the only way. Truthdig reports, quote, a survey of the New York Times archives shows the Times editorial board has supported 10 out of 12 American-backed coups in Latin America, with two editorials, those involving the 1983 Granada invasion and the 2009 Honduras coup, ranging from ambiguous to reluctant opposition. The reason the CIA and US military and its corporate partisans historically target governments in Latin America is because those governments are hostile to US capital and strategic interests, not because they are undemocratic. So while the points the Times makes about illiberalism may sometimes be true, they're mostly a non sequitur when analyzing the reality of what's unfolding." End quote. So in short, this is how America does things. First, priority is American economic interests. Who is going to play ball? Who is going to let American and American corporations have their way and enjoy the world's economic resources for pennies on the dollar? Most countries will quickly open their doors because who doesn't love America? Quote, the West is so superior in every way, freedom, democracy, human rights, please teach us your ways, just don't shoot." End quote. But of course, there will always be the troublemakers who just can't get with the program. So what does America do? Impose crippling sanctions, brutal sanctions that end up starving the population to death. Who can forget US Secretary of State Madeleine Albright saying 500,000 Iraqi children starving to death was, quote, worth it, end quote. Then the American media dutifully reports on the human misery and says, see, these poor people are dying. We have to do something for those poor starving children. Of course, the human misery that is suffered due to the tyranny of American friendly dictators is not commented upon or seen as a reason for action. So the Muslim world is not unique in its backwardness at all. Not at all. Many regions outside of North America and Western Europe are economically stunted in the same way. So why does Islam get all the blame? Why does the Islamic tradition and traditional Islamic scholarship get the blame? Why does Muslim male authority get the blame? This makes no sense. We have to recognize what is really happening, a hostage situation. All these countries have the gun to their heads. After a while, Stockholm Syndrome sets in, i.e. a psychological phenomenon where the hostage starts to feel affectionate and affinity for the kidnapper. 
Whenever someone starts running his mouth about the Muslim world lagging behind and how that is a function of Islam, just point him to all these other non-Muslim countries. What explains their plight? Is it just that a handful of countries in the West figured out the magic formula for not starving to death and wallowing in squalor and the other 90% of the world's population is utterly clueless? What allowed Western Europe to discover the magic formula and not the rest of the world? Is there some kind of racial superiority that Europeans have that allowed them to do this? Is the white Aryan race special? Is that what the New York Times and Donald Trump want us to believe? The Hypocrisy of Islamic Reform Sometimes Muslim reformists or Muslims taking on certain reformist positions will cite a rare, unusual classical opinion to support their view. This is of course cherry picking and it is intellectually dishonest. This is the same critique we would make against terror groups like ISIS and their approach to Islamic texts. What both ISIS and these reformists are doing is post hoc justification. They already have something they want to accomplish. Whether it is advancing political terror or advancing some liberal ideology, whatever the case may be, and then they scan the vast sea of Islamic scholarship for anything that might lend support to their particular agenda. Most of the time, by the way, even their reading of the classical texts is wrong or ripped out of necessary context, but let's put that aside. We know that actions are by intentions, so that should be the question when we are confronted by these reform efforts. They will claim such and such is a known opinion within the tradition. And that may be true, but our question should be, why are we citing these unusual opinions? What is the intention here? To advance a certain point of liberal ideology, which itself is intellectually and morally questionable? Rather than bastardizing Islamic scholarship, why not exercise a little bit of critical thinking and question that liberal position? In other words, sincerity entails being a concern with a majority position first and foremost, even if one does not always accept or follow it. Because probabilistically speaking, the majority position is more likely to represent the truth. But if one's main concern is justifying one's own views, any opinion, no matter how rare or underrepresented, is good enough. Progressive and Modernist Muslim Reform When you compare the traditional schools of fiqh, you will find some of them to be more difficult to follow in some areas and easier to follow in other areas. For example, the requirements and conditions of wudu in school A might be more difficult to satisfy than school B, but school B is easier or more lenient in terms of travel, etc. But when you look at the opinions of model reformers on matters of fiqh, they all trend in one direction. They all take very predictable positions with the only apparent common thread tying them together is that they accord with and accommodate the sensibilities, biases, and aspirations of modern Western bourgeoisie people. Any rational person can see that this is not a coincidence. This is the glaring red flag that signals us that these reformers have no consistent usul, i.e. principles, by which they are deriving their opinions. Rather, they settle on their opinion whatever is most concordant with the dominant social conventions, i.e. what they sometimes call reason, and then, after the fact, try to cobble together justification from a highly selective reading of the Quran and Hadith, and perhaps other rare minority opinions they may find from legit ulama. Despite all this, these reforms insist on being taken seriously by the rest of us. The Insight of the Faux Traditionalist Advocate a minority, or even shat opinion, expressed somewhere by someone in a corpus of Islamic scholarship, and so long as it conforms to modernist, liberal, feminist sensibilities, you are a sage traditionalist brimming with wisdom. Advocate a majority or predominant positions of the schools of thought within the Islamic sciences that conflicts with said modernist ideologies, and you are an out-of-touch, inflexible extremist who doesn't understand context and is driving the ummah to mass apostasy. The Modernist Playbook Use this handy guide to easily dispute every normative claim Islam makes that violates modern liberal secular values. Using these rebuttals, you can justify virtually anything and make it seem like the Islamic scholarly tradition is on your side. With this guide, you can undermine those pesky traditional Muslims and champion your reformist Islam all the while coming across as a nuanced and learned scholar in your own right. Traditionalist There is consensus on this topic. Modernist rebuttal. Actually, consensus is a highly contested issue. Traditionalist. These narrations are mutawatir, i.e. mass transmitted. Modernist rebuttal. Actually, tawatur is a highly contested issue. Traditionalist. This is the relied upon view of the four Sunni schools. Modernist rebuttal. We don't have to limit ourselves to the schools because we live in a different context today. 
Traditionalist. This is an established position in one school. Modernist. Well, the majority of scholars say otherwise, so we can trash the minority position. Traditionalist. This is the majority position. Modernist. Well, there is a minority position that says otherwise, so we can safely ignore the majority. Traditionalist. This ayah is qatti, i.e. clear-cut. Modernist. No, it's not. Traditionalist. This hadith is unequivocal. Modernist. But it is an ahad hadith, so we can safely ignore it. Traditionalist. This is the strongest position within the school. Modernist. But there is a solitary narration relaying the statement of a sahabi that contradicts that position, so we can safely ignore it. Traditionalist. Most of the tafsir on this ayat convey the same interpretation. Modernist. Yeah. But there is one tafsir that says something slightly different, so that proves that the other tafsir are the result of cultural bias. Traditionalist. The fuqaha, i.e. Islamic jurists, are agreed on this. Modernist. The fuqaha are limited in their knowledge of hadith. We have to look at what the muhadithun, i.e. hadith specialists, said. Traditionalist. The muhadithun are agreed on this. Modernist. The muhadithun are limited in their knowledge of fiqh. We have to look at what the fuqaha said. Traditionalist. The fuqaha and the muhadithun are agreed on this. Modernist. But we live in a different context, so our own ijtihad is necessary. Islam is a living tradition, etc. See how easy it is to weasel your way out of anything and everything? When you aren't beholden to standards of consistency and basic intellectual honesty, you can justify pretty much anything and look good doing it. Enjoy! Hypocrisy on Gender Separation Muslim reformists, liberals, progressives who oppose gender separation are often very aggressive and their aggressiveness matches the indignation they feel at the notion that genders should be separated. But why is this such a problem? Even the most secular societies impose gender separation to some extent. Bathrooms are gendered. Locker rooms are gendered. Sports are gendered in general. Secular societies recognize male and female and operationalize those gender distinctions in countless ways. Muslims simply operationalize gender somewhat differently. But since Muslim practices and gender separation differ from the dominant Western model, that is a problem. Rather than just acknowledge that Muslims do it differently, these reformists and critics of Islam make it seem like Islam is the only religion and worldview that facilitates gender separation and is therefore backwards and barbaric. Knowledge versus the appearance of knowledge. Quote, and what it is said to them, believe as the people have believed, they say. Should we believe as the fools have believed? Unquestionably, it is they who are the fools, but they do not know. Al-Baqarah, Quran, chapter 2, verse 13. There are many people who call the believers fools in this day and age. Allah tells us that unquestionably, undoubtedly, these people are the real fools and they themselves are unaware of this and do not know the truth. Unfortunately, many Muslims do not realize this either. Instead of seeing the rejecters and deniers as fools, they are often seen as respected experts, scholars, intelligentsia, etc. And their work is even promoted among the Muslims to such an extent that Muslims start modifying and editing their beliefs to conform to the theories and ideologies of those who have very explicitly and adamantly rejected Iman. And many Muslims don't see any contradiction in this. And where it gets really sad and really pitiful is when Muslims look up to these people and because of their admiration and respect for them, they start denouncing their own scholars calling the great ulama of the ummah as essentially fools who had limited intellects were just speaking out of whim and desire, did not truly understand the meaning of the Quran and Sunnah, etc. What is the cause of this? One of the main factors is that these Muslims have been enchanted with ideas that they do not fully understand. When you do not fully understand something, you have two options. You can just outright reject it, even when you don't know why you are rejecting it. Or you can judge its value according to appearances. Does this look like something legitimate? Does this sound like it is coming from a learned place? Are reputable people endorsing this? Do the masses accept this? Is it popular? Basically, if something has all the appearances of knowledge, then that is good enough to accept it. Much of what Muslims today accept of these various modernist ideologies are done on this basis. You do have a handful who will just reject things regardless. That is the safer path, but it does not help the wider ummah. Therefore, what is needed is to fully understand these ideologies. My experience is, and my claim is, that when that happens, it will be very obvious how foolish and contemptible they are. Then we will know indubitably and unquestionably who are the true fools. American Islam 
If American Islam just means eating cheeseburgers after Friday prayers instead of biryani, then no one has an issue with that. The American Islam that people have a problem with is when deen is compromised for no other reason than to accommodate American sensibilities and culture. Examples. In America, it is okay for Muslim women to marry non-Muslim men because of XYZ aspects of the culture. In America, it is okay to have women and men pray side by side because of XYZ aspects of the culture. In America, it is okay for non-Mahrams to go on dates and use hookup apps because XYZ aspects of the culture. In America, it is okay to smoke weed recreationally because of XYZ aspects of the culture. In America, it is okay for Muslims to attend and participate in the religious rituals of Christians, Jews, etc. because of XYZ aspects of the culture. In America, it is okay for Muslim kids to go to prom because of XYZ aspects of the culture. In America, it is okay to consume riba, which is technically not riba anyway, because of XYZ aspects of the culture. In America, it is okay for Muslim women to get abortions if they are not financially stable because of XYZ aspects of the culture. In America, it is okay to support LGBT whatever because XYZ aspects of the culture. In America, it is okay to ignore norms of gender separation in the mosque or other religious gatherings because of XYZ aspects of the culture and on and on. If this is American Islam, count me out. But I will be happy to sit down with you for a cheeseburger or biryani. The Western Strategy for Dominating the Muslim World Quote, A leaked memo shows that the Trump White House was advised by the State Department to promote an Islamic reformation and to use women and young people in the Muslim-majority world to front it. Focusing on female empowerment as the primary information messaging goal within the Islamic influence world will allow the United States to maintain a moral component for American power and its liberation narrative. End quote. Focusing on women and youth to control the Muslim world and distort Islam is not new. It has always been the central strategy of colonizers, not only in the Muslim world, but also Native America, Aboriginal Australia, China, etc., for the past few hundred years. Colonizers like Lord Cromer and others specifically focus on the claim that European values and European men came to empower Muslim women while Islamic values and Muslim men imprisoned women, abused them, subjugated them. They argued that Islamic law needs reform in order to accommodate women's rights. First and foremost, Muslim women must take off the hijab and dress like European women to be free. Second, women have to refuse and resist any and all male authority, whether the husbands, the fathers, or the male scholars. Furthermore, the barbaric institution of polygyny must be abolished. Muslim women must insist on leaving domestic drudgery and joining the workforce, which conveniently meant becoming cheap, dispensable laborers for the colonizers, and much more that has been meticulously documented in many academic works. The ultimate purpose of this multi-pronged attack was to destroy the Muslim family. The colonizers aimed to destroy that critical central institution of Islam and the Ummah, which is strong, cohesive Muslim family, pitting wives against husbands, daughters and against fathers, sisters against brothers, to slowly but surely gain complete control of and authority over the Muslim masses. This has always been the plan. All this was done under the mantra of female empowerment. That's how it was marketed for the last couple of centuries. This is why Muslim feminists, with their calls to upturn the tradition and reform the Sharia, are simply advancing the work of colonizers and imperialists. This is why it is a contradiction in terms to be a feminist and decolonial or anti-imperialist at the same time. I am often accused by detractors of being obsessed with feminism and its activism. Well, it's not my fault that the main path of attack on Islam is through women's issues, as good old Trump's State Department made clear in the leaked memo. I, for one, am not going to sit back and ignore this critical issue and let enemies feast on the Ummah unimpeded. I have often detailed the nefarious activities of Muslim reformist groups in the US and how they are receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars from the US government to advance Muslim women's empowerment. Many wonder why the US government would pump so much money to help out small Muslim organizations. Well, here is your answer. It is all part of the overarching plan to reform Islam according to the vision of imperialists. These reformists and feminist organizations are simply their enthusiastic agents aggressively trying to infiltrate our masjids, Islamic schools, etc. Hadith and Epistemology Adam's Height some Muslims react with extreme skepticism when they read the hadith, quote, Allah created Adam and he was 60 cubits tall. Then he said, go and greet those angels and listen to how they greet you, for that will be your greeting and the greeting of your progeny. He said, 
Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. They said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace be upon you and the mercy of Allah. So they have added words, wa rahmatullah. And everyone who enters paradise will be in the form of Adam. People kept on growing smaller until now. End quote. These Muslims want to know what is the evidence of Adam and humans being this height. It is a funny question because if you are a Muslim, the evidence is the Sahih Hadith. That is the evidence. The only reason you would think that that is not evidence is if you are generally skeptical for all Hadith, in which case you are just a confused person and have bigger things to worry about than the height of Adam. Or you take current scientific consensus as a sounder source of knowledge about the height of Adam than Sahih Hadith, in which case you think either the Prophet ﷺ misdescribed his height or that the Hadith transmitters made a mistake. And given the text of the Hadith and the fact that the height of Adam is mentioned in multiple Sahih Hadith, it would have to have been a pretty extensive mistake. We can evaluate all this. First, we should know that we don't take current scientific consensus as relevant when it comes to many things described in the Hadith. Think of Al-Isra' wal Mi'raj, or any of the miracles of the Prophets. Think of any of the signs of the Day of Judgment, for example, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, etc. What if you have a problem with Hadith? Then consider any of the events and things mentioned in the Quran. So if current scientific consensus is not germane to any of these topics, why is it suddenly so all-determinative when it comes to the height of Adam? Also, I am afraid that people who take current scientific consensus so seriously are often deeply ignorant about the nature and the history of science. I have personal experience with this as a physics student at Harvard, as well as a philosophy and history of science student there, and at Tufts. Some of my professors were either Nobel Prize winners or on their way to winning it, and their ignorance about some of the basics of science history was astounding. They simply didn't even think it was important to know the history of science. Not surprisingly, that lack of interest and knowledge resulted in a very narrow, myopic understanding of science itself, which is ironic considering how accomplished they were in the sciences. One piece of science history that is relevant to this discussion is that past archaeologists believe in the existence of giant human beings. They base their belief on fossils and discovered bone fragments. Consider the fossils of the species named Meganthropus. Is it surprising that current scientists are unaware of this? No. They are simply ignorant of the history of their own field, but that does not erase the work and the historical record of their predecessors. As for myself as a Muslim, I don't privilege the speculative over the definite, and I have no hesitations or qualms taking the Sahih Hadith at face value and feeling perfectly intellectually content and confident. In fact, a Hadith like that are gems that I treasure because they inform me about the true nature of the world and history that I wouldn't be privy to otherwise, since current scientific consensus says something different. By the way, stop with this nonsense about bone strength versus height. If bones are sufficiently dense, they can support a creature of a given height. Arguing against this hadith on the basis of bone structure is like arguing against the possibility of al-Isra on the basis that the bura couldn't have been aerodynamic enough to make the trip in such a short period of time. NB one of the foremost scholars in the world, Mufti Taqi Osmani, relays an interpretation of this hadith from Sheikh Anwar Shah al-Kashimiri according to which Adam was much taller in the garden and then became smaller when he was sent to earth. He bases his opinion on an analysis of the language of the Hadith. Whether or not this interpretation is correct, Allah knows best. But the point is, neither interpretation depends on contemporary scientific facts. The Progressives versus the Faux Traditionalists Which person poses more of a danger to the Ummah? The openly progressive Muslim, calling for the reform of Islam by, among other things, throwing away all hadith since there are so many misogynistic narrations in the Sahih collections, etc., or the learned Sheikh, who has studied at Al Hazhar or elsewhere, who is no less under the influence of modern ideologies like secularism, liberalism, and feminism, but rather than openly calling for a complete overhaul of the deen, instead resorts to misapplying obscure minority opinions, bastardizing the concept of maqasid disqualifying otherwise sound hadith on dubious grounds, employing highly creative Arabic etymological contortions, bastardizing the concept of urf, downplaying the scholarly acumen of luminaries like Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, the four imams, etc., may Allah have mercy on them, in order to present a nuanced and scholarly opinion that is more relevant for modern times. The Multi-Headed Hydra of Muslim Reformism is it necessary to provide a rebuttal to so-called reformist progressive Muslims? Not really. If you try to engage in debate with them, it is a fruitless exercise because they have no usul. 
They have no clear, explicit principles they use to derive all the strange, divergent opinions they come up with. So if you try to hold them to something, they quickly pivot to something else, and the conversation goes nowhere. I speak from experience, a lot of face-palming experience. But you don't need to engage reformist progressive Muslims in order to completely debunk everything they stand for. You do this by attacking the root of their ideology, liberal modernist thought. That is something worth spending your time on. Consider this example. Reformists make a big deal about hijab and gender separation in general and how it is oppressive, patriarchal, etc. etc. The more sophisticated reformists will cherry pick from different historical texts and trot out a generous helping of maqasid based reasoning to make their case. Some people might certainly want to get their hands dirty and point out all the things they got wrong about the texts and their bastardization of maqasid maslaha and other fiqh principles. And this is an admirable endeavor in its own right. But unfortunately, the reformists will just shift the argument and use another set of texts and another set of arguments. Like fighting a mythological hydra, you cut off one head and two more grow in its place. A more efficient route is to just stab the hydra in the heart by critiquing the modernist assumptions about dress, oppression, patriarchy, gender roles, etc. By debunking these notions, you take the wind out of the reformist sails. And since the vast majority of these reformists are shallow thinkers, they usually haven't even reflected on the roots of their own ideology to see if they are sound or hold up to the least amount of scrutiny. It is quite sad, actually, that people destroy their iman and try to change their religion on the basis of such flimsy philosophies that are relevant only because they are trendy at this point in time, but otherwise have no redeeming intellectual or moral quality. Lizard Hole Cometh In the Quran, Allah gave us such detailed description of Bani Israel and their crimes and spiritual deficiencies because the Muslims would mirror their evolution. The well-known hadith of Muslims following the path of those before them step by step testifies to this depressing eventuality. Quote, you would walk the same path as was taken by those before you inch by inch and step by step, so much so that if they had entered into the hole of the lizard, you would follow them in this also, we said. Allah's messenger, do you mean Jews and Christians? He said, who else? End quote. And when we look around us, we see as clear as day that the Messenger wasallam undoubtedly spoke the truth. Reflect on the relevant ayat, and you will see the same behaviors and actions not with a small minority of the ummah, but increasingly the majority and their leaders. To those who are not satisfied with their religion and seek to reform it to their liking, quote, And if you turn away, he will replace you with another people, then they will not be the likes of you. End quote. Muhammad Quran chapter 47 verse 38 Alhamdulillah Sadaqallahu alazim